Welcome to the latest Long Distance Lowy Institute event. We're focused on Australia's decision to cancel its French submarine contract in favour of partnering with the US and the UK on nuclear-powered boats, and indeed on much closer military and technological cooperation generally. Rarely has an Australian foreign policy decision sent so many ripples around the world. The announcement has implications for US, Chinese, European and Southeast Asian diplomacy and defence policies. I'm Richard McGregor, a Senior Fellow for East Asia at the Lowy Institute. Tonight, I'm delighted to be speaking with Bilahari Kausakan, the former head of the Singaporean Foreign Ministry, Yun Sun of the Stimson Centre in Washington, D.C., and Nadej Roland of the National Bureau of Asian Research in the United States. None of our guests obviously speak for any government, but they do have a great deal of knowledge about what the respective governments think. Yun, I want to start with you. Uh, America's relations with China, Australia's relations with China were already poor before this decision. A against that background, how would you characterize the reaction uh, in Beijing so far? Has this decision fundamentally changed anything? Well, Richard, thank you for the invitation to be here, first of all. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. The relationship between China and the United States and also China between China and Australia have already in a pretty bad shape. And the, this announcement of the uh, nuclear-powered submarines to be provided to Australia certainly has, uh, has, has led to the deterioration of the, um, of the relationship further. I would say in China, the Chinese see the severity of the challenge from Australia obtaining the nuclear power, the subs as high, but the urgency of the threat as moderate so far, because the high threat perception is due to the fact that nuclear powered submarine will be armed with US cruise missiles. And even the United States may not have the ability to deploy that many nuclear submarines to the region, for example, in the South China Sea. But on the other hand, I think Beijing also maintains a wait and see attitude about the assessment because the details are not yet worked out and the consultations will take time. So the Chinese are not yet sure whether the submarines will be built in Australia or they will come from a retired uh, US fleet. To build the submarines will require five to 10 years, which means the threat is not immediate. But in terms of the official reactions, we have seen uh, two focuses basically. The first one is focused on the geopolitical impact of the deal and the attack on the uh, United States, UK and Australia for their so-called Cold War mentality. So some have equated this, uh, this AUKUS as a as an Asian version of NATO with the potential to expand to include other like-minded countries. The second and more significant reaction is focused on the nu nuclear non-proliferation issue the Chinese permanent representative to UN in Vienna has already made a statement on the second day accusing the deal as quote, quote, undisguised nuclear proliferation activities. He also called for IAEA to, pub to publicly condemn AUKUS, which demonstrates a double standard US and UK pursue on the nuclear export control. So these are primarily the Chinese reactions so far. And I would say that all, uh, all the signs and signals are pointing into a pretty dark and abysmal direction. Just a quick follow-up. I mean, China has had a, a very large military buildup in the last couple of decades, Navy, cyber capability, missiles and the like. Public statements are one thing. Privately, certainly, China must have expected a reaction in the region of some kind eventually. That's a very good question. So where did this uh, regional arms race really start, right? And the Chinese have been modernizing their military capability. They have been expand, expanding their fleets. So using that criteria, other countries' reaction would be, would be natural and, and, and normal. But unfortunately, that's hardly a perception that Chinese will share because the Chinese feel that their military buildup has always and will always be a response to the U.S. predominance militarily in the region. So they were not anticipating that other countries in the region would follow suit. But in my view, that is a negligence on the Chinese part not to understand or expect the reaction to their military modernization. Okay, thank you. Nadej, if I could uh, move to you now. Now, you live in the U.S., but you, you worked previously in the French uh, Defense Ministry. The French reaction has been furious on many levels, that's clear. Um, but 
to quote one a French journalist, uh, is this a spat or is it a crisis? How, how big a deal is it for France and, of course, for Europe more generally? Yeah, I think the the past week really has uh, has been a France has been in shock. I think first um, shocking, shocked by the lack of consultation, shocked by the uh, unconscionable behavior of two very strong allies, um, and um, a lot of uh, of anger uh, after that shock uh, coming up. Um, and a lot of puzzlement also about the logic behind this, um, because it seemed like what the French had been trying to build with uh, Australia was responding pretty much to uh, what Australia wanted um, and made perfect uh, strategic sense. So a lot of, uh, a lot of emotions, as, as everybody can, can see it, I think things are going to calm down a little bit. Um, Obviously, uh, French leaders are not uh, just uh, moved by their emotions. They're also state leaders. And so they're starting to reconsider uh, what is the best position that they're going to take out of this. Um, but I think it's not just a spat. Obviously, you know, France has been uh, one of the strongest American allies for a long time. And I don't think that this is going to change anytime soon. We've been through various crises over the past few decades. Um, I think uh, one of my friends who is a diplomat um, uh, told me recently that I think it's uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew you said, who said that the Americans are betraying one of their friends every 10 years. But that seems for the French that it's more often than that nowadays. So this is not a great position to be in. Um, at the same time, I think there, um, you know, there's, uh, there are things that will not change. Uh, and we're going to try to find ways to go through this crisis. Um, in the longer term, you know, this agreement with Australia was really seen by the French authorities at as the backbone of their Indo-Pacific presence together with uh, the, uh, the strategic partnerships that they have built over the last decade, both with Japan and India in particular, but also other countries in the region, Singapore, Malaysia, um, among others. Um, and But this one was really a strong commitment, political one, strategic one. Um, and now we're, <laughs> We're going to have to recalibrate a little bit of that, um, keeping in mind that our national interests have not changed. Uh, China is still a nation in the Pacific. We have territories, we have economic zones, we have citizens, uh, we have lots of strategic interests, economic and others. Uh, and so we're not going to go away. Uh, it's just how is it that we're going to translate this presence uh, militarily and, and in other terms with, with partners in the region. So that's, that's the big next question, I think. It's this keeping this focus on the region um, finding other ways to do it. A, a, a quick follow-up. Um, uh, President Biden, he angered many in Europe with his handling of Afghanistan, the Afghanistan withdrawal. Uh, I think the French foreign minister described him as Trump without the tweets. Um, is there a sort of a, a hardening view of Biden in France and Europe? I'm not sure there's a hardening view. I think um, there's a lot of... Uh, Inter interrogations really about who is in, who was behind this decision because you know the Biden administration really came uh, came in with this idea that they're going to rebuild the the fractured um, uh, relationship with American allies uh, in Europe and in Asia, um, and so this doesn't bode well for this kind of policy if this is how you're going to treat your your allies. Um, and um, so I think it's possible that in the next few months, we're going to perhaps have some mm, many more elements about what happened inside of the US and also in this, inside of Australia, because it seems like this has been an agreement that has been kept very, very secret 
uh, and perhaps even inside of the administrations in the US and, and in Australia, not everybody has been included in, in making that decision or perhaps not really seeing the potential damage that this could do uh, in other areas, including in the relationship with France. So there's going to be a lot of, of, uh, of things coming up, I suppose, um, in, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, so yeah, everything is, in, yeah. is okay. a little bit up in the air right now. Okay. Bilahari, let me bring you in, if we can turn to Southeast Asia. Now that's obviously a diverse region. There's been a variety of reactions. What, are there any threads out of those reactions that you can pull together for us so far that, that are meaningful? Yeah, well, you are right, Richard. There have been a variety of reactions. Um, Indonesia and Malaysia have not been very positive about it, Singapore more so. The uh, Philippines has been uh, positive about it. <clears throat> Vietnam hasn't said anything that I know of, but I don't think they will be upset by this decision for the obvious reasons. Myanmar has its own problems and Thailand is preoccupied with uh, you know, its own issues. Uh, but that said, I think over the last 15, 20 years, maybe, there has been a growing understanding in Southeast Asia that a position that Singapore has never been shy about publicly stating that the US presence is a vital and irreplaceable element of any balance in the region. It's not just a, an eccentric Singaporean attitude, but a strategic reality. Uh, and what is driving this realization is um, concern over certain aspects of Chinese behavior. Nobody, nobody wants to shun China, but everybody has some degree of concerns about Chinese behavior not just about the South China Sea, mind you, but more generally. You can see it in the reaction in 1990 when Singapore signed the MOU with the US to allow the use of some facilities. Uh, our neighbors, Indonesia and Malaysia reacted hysterically almost. But when we renewed that, uh, that MOU in 2019, there was no reaction. And when we concluded a strategic partnership agreement with the US in 2005, there was no reaction. Now, um, I think Southeast Asia is diverse. You will always have a, a variety of diverse public reactions, but privately in all but maybe one or two countries, what I have just described is the general attitude. And this uh, new agreement between the US, UK, Australia, and the, the agreement to provide nuclear submarines can be must be seen in that context, right? Yes, I, I guess one of the themes that comes through in discussions with Southeast Asian countries is that they don't want to be drawn into great power competition uh, between US and China. Is that is that for ASEAN for Southeast Asia? Is that a realistic position? No, it's a really stupid position. I mean, look. For, in the 1970s, we had this idea of Zotfan, a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality, based on the idea that you know all the world's ills uh, came from the major powers, and you keep the major powers out, uh, everything you know, milk and honey will flow, right? It's a really stupid idea. The offshoot of that is the Southeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone, something that is completely unrealizable uh, uh, in practice and has no no practical strategic effect. That undercurrent is there. It is considerably weakened by events, uh, particularly since Mr. Xi Jinping came to power, but that undercurrent is there, but it is not the main undercurrent. In fact, the way ASEAN conceives of regional security is fundamentally changed. From thinking that if we just keep all the major powers out, everything will be wonderful, we now want to engage all the major powers so as to create a kind of omnidirectional balance uh, to try to enhance the natural multipolarity of this region that maximizes maneuver space. That's the fundamental underlying purpose of things like the ADMM Plus, uh, the East Asia Summit, and even the ARF, which was our first experiment in that direction. Uh, but the old attitudes still linger on <laughs> because the hardest things to change, as you know, is somebody's mind. 
and yes. old ideas, antiquated ideas linger on. In fact, I think um, the new Malaysian Prime Minister in responding to the uh, this new deal uh, between US, Australia and and the UK actually referred to Zofan. I could barely stop myself laughing. Um, excellent. We'll move on from that point of humour. You and I will come to, come to you now. One of the criticisms in Australia is that, you know, Australia has basically bet the house, doubled down, uh, all in with the United States at a time when the US, US domestic politics is highly unstable and when US, the US is in relative decline, not decline, relative decline comp compared to China. Well, what do you think about that? I mean, you're looking on it as an outsider. Is that, is that a, a, uh, a, a smart foreign policy decision by a country for a country like Australia? Well, whether it is smart will lead to uh, will leave it to the Australian people to decide in their next next election, and also for the history to decide. Because uh, in 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 at least the Chinese narrative, there are a lot of people who predict that Australia in the end will cry in despair, and that's in Chinese pronunciation also equates to aukus. So aukus it means uh, Australia will eventually cry in despair. So I think you have to take into multiple factors into consideration. For example, this deal is extremely expensive and it's potentially going to cost Australia an arm and a leg. Of course, if uh, Canberra believes it is necessary, then strategically speaking, there's no, there's no price tag for it. But on the other hand, there is also the impact because these are nuclear powered submarines and the US is the one who possesses the, the technology. So coming to the maintenance, the training, the staffing, the equipment of the um, to sustain these uh, nuclear power submarines is going to be a permanent deal for as long as Australia keeps them. Australia will have to rely on the United States to provide those uh, those support. So the question then is that well, is Australia really willing to be forever bound to the uh, to the U.S. strategic agenda in the region, and is that a, a smart move for a mid for a middle power? And I think, at least from what I read on Australian media, uh, the former the former three prime ministers of Australia also have very different views as for whether this is indeed a smart move. But I would say that um, looking from the perspective of Sino-Australia relations since last year, the Chinese has done significant amount of uh, hard bashing of Australia, especially in terms of the diplomatic interaction in terms of the rhetoric and in terms of the some of the, the trade issues. So I would say that Morrison's decision is, uh, did not come out of nothing, did not come out of thin air. And there is a significant background of deterioration of relations between China and Australia. And this deal is part of the reaction or part of the consequences to that reality. Yes, I mean, that's an interesting point. I wonder whether that has any impact uh, inside China at all. It's hard to tell. Now, Des, let me ask you the similar question. Um, uh, you obviously um, have criticism of how this was handled diplomatically by both Australia and the United States and the damage on uh, the French position on uh, uh, strategy on uh, uh, Indochina. But from where you sit, does this look like a, a, a foolhardy bet to go all in with the United States? Uh, in a project like this, which binds us to them in, in sovereign ways for decades? I, I think I will have the same response as Yun Sun. It's really, it, this is a sovereignty, it's a sovereign choice. It's a sovereign decision from, from Australia's part. And I think I want to give the Australian government the benefit of the doubt deeply inside of me thinking, okay, this is a, this is a deeply thought through um, decision that has been made uh, and the overarching strategy uh, answers a um, worsening security environment that supersedes every other consideration. And perhaps Australia has decided that it is a middle power and that um, befriending or getting closer in terms of you know, security partnerships uh, with other middle powers is not going to be enough in the face of the challenge that is at stake. 
Um, so if this is the calculation, um, I mean, this again, this is this is Australia's decision um, and I, I'm not going to go against it. I'm just wondering really whether um, abandoning something that has already been going on uh, with a lot of progress being made uh, with an extremely important um, transfer of uh, technologies component uh, in the long run is going to be easily replaced uh, by a by something that we don't really know about yet. Uh, they're saying that they're going to have a 18 month period of uh, consultations. Um, how, what is it going to happen uh, exactly? What kind of agreements at what level uh, uh, is, are going to, to be made? This is really a, a big black box uh, right now. So uh, when everything is in place, um, Perhaps uh, we can come back and discuss about it and saying, is it, was that the right decision to make? Uh, right now, I still have, have uh, really questions that I, I suppose the Australian internal debate is going to be about as well. I, I, I would think so in terms of budget, in terms of human resources, in terms of implications for um, um, transfer of technologies, um, implications for the, the, the building that industrial base that Australia doesn't have right now in terms of uh, guarantees, um, don't know. Yes, well, that's certainly true, I think. I mean, the French uh, contract was difficult enough. This is of a dimension which is uh, even more complex. Bilahari, I mean, in the past, you've praised Australia's uh, toughening of its policy on China, but more recently, I think you were a little wonder whether the pendulum had swung too far. How does the decision look from where you sit? Okay, let's not be hypocritical about this. Huh? The US has always been Australia's major security partner. There is no alternative. Right? Who are, who's going to be your security partner if not the US? Russia, China, Singapore, we are your security partner, but we're insignificant, right? So this is a continuation. It's not a new situation except for the nuclear submarine deal. And that's one part, but the overall strategic situation for Australia has not changed. When I, I was in the US recently, and I was constantly asked in different ways, is the US reliable? That was vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. And my answer was always the same. The US is of course not reliable. Every four years, poor sorts like me, when I was in government, had to go to the US and tell them the same thing over and over again. How can that be reliable? But that's the wrong question. Is there an alternative to the US to maintain a balance in, in our region? And the answer is obviously no. So if the answer is no, there is no alternative, you adapt yourself to the reality of the US. And that is a new adaptation. Now, how the submarine deal will work out, I don't know, right? It's now just an idea, right? But it's, let's, not, uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that Australia has no other alternative for a major security partner. Japan, South Korea, these are allies like Australia is of the US. And that, by the way, is true of France too. Uh, I think French are understandably upset for a variety of reasons. If I was them, I would be upset too. But I think the French are not, um, despite the, the reputation of being emotional, you are also very pragmatic. And I just have read in the South China Morning Post today that uh, France has decided to send its ambassador back to Washington. Because the hard fact is, France sends, I think Nadine will know better, I think four or five times a year, its naval vessels to its specific ter territories. And that's very welcome by everybody, particularly in the current circumstances. But the hard fact is, without the Seventh Fleet, you cannot maintain your access to those specific territories uh, by yourself, right? Uh, and in time, as China builds up its blue water Navy capability, that will be also true of your Indian Ocean territories. So nobody has very much choice, right, in the matter. And that's the fact of the, that's the hard strategic reality of where we are now. And how did we get here? We got here because China for, 
no doubt very good, probably mainly domestic reasons in my view, has decided to adopt a certain foreign policy posture in this region. All right, and therefore it has elicited various reactions. And this is just the latest reaction. Yes. Um, speaking of those reactions, John, if I could go back to you, we discussed Southeast Asia and ASEAN. Uh, perhaps more important are the quad countries, India and Japan. Um, they seem to have welcomed this. Will China, China doesn't seem to be too worried or at least in public about criticism from any of these countries these days. Um, if you've got India and uh, Japan, the US, Australia meeting a first in-person quad summit this week, we've got the subs decision. Do you sense any, um, plus of course, Chinese domestic politics, the party Congress next year, et cetera, et cetera. Do you sense any recalibration on China's part? Um, um, you might wonder why China would recalibrate, particularly as China is still growing and adding to its uh, military weight and the like. I mean, can you give us any sense of that? Sure, I will, I will try. I think for China, one of the most important criteria in evaluating whether China should adopt a different position is that whether these countries' policy towards China can be influenced. In other, way, in other words, if China adopts a, a softer or a more conciliatory approach to Australia, would Australia still insist on the tracing of the origin of COVID, which has been identified by the Chinese as a major irritant? And in the case of India, if China adopts a more conciliatory position towards India on, for example, the issue of the border dispute, would India stop regarding China as a security threat? So, and coming to other countries like, uh, like Japan, that will Japan ever feel that China's rise is good news for Japan? So I think when the Chinese look, put things in, in that comparative uh, perspective and try to understand to what extent these countries' China policy is really subject to Chinese influence, I think they realize that while well, India will always see China as a threat and Australia will not stop blaming China or insisting on tracing the origin of COVID-19 in China, and the Japan will always identify U.S.-Japan alliance as a pillar of the regional security and that sees itself as U.S. most loyal, the best partner, the best ally, and therefore a, um, a Sino-Japan improvement of relations will never exceed the level of uh, the security alliance Japan has with the United States. So I understand this is quite a, um, a binary black or white perception on the Chinese side that whether uh, in the end we could really influence these countries' policy. And when they determine that the answer is negative, that these countries are going to see China as a threat regardless, then for China, the answer seems to have become easier that, okay, well, then we will just adopt the, the most direct approach to pursue our national interest. Then, of course, it's also, also subject to debate as for uh, whether things like AUKUS or Quad is indeed in China's national interest. But I think a key point that I have observed in the Chinese policy community is that this is inevitable and it has to happen anyway. That's, I must say, that's a very fatalistic view of things that China is going to rise whether we like it or not. I mean, Nadez, let me bounce that off you. I mean, can China reassure its neighbours in any fashion at all, or, or is this just the way it is? I think we've passed that point a while ago already. And the, the charm offensive is, uh, dates back several years now. And uh, this, is, this is about rejuvenation. It's about, uh, it's about rising. Uh, like it or not, China is going to rise. Um, I think what we're seeing is just it's an illustration of how those tensions are going to be more and more difficult to manage. Um, for a while, I think people were in the region were thinking, you know, in economic integration or, or interdependence with China and balancing um, either between ourselves or as as you know, Harry just mentioned under the American umbrella uh, to, to guarantee the, the security. Um, is this going to be um, 
perpetually possible it's going to be a, this is a it, it's it's a fundamental question i i don't have an, any answer to that um but maybe if 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 i can just for a second go back to what uh, Bilahari just said about you know let's face it the only security guarantor in the region is going to be the us i i i think this is very true what what i wanted to uh point at is that it's not either only the us or nothing there was there is still uh, a lot of uh, you know mini lateral or a web of cooperations among region among regional partners that can supplement and complement uh, the the american presence uh, without conflicting against each other and i think the problem with the it's not the problem of AUKUS, it's the problem of the way AUKUS was born uh, and, and delivered to the world. Um, that makes it much more difficult, I think, in the future to, you know, restart the, 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 the trust that we had with each other uh, very quickly. Um, and this is going to take some time to, I think, uh, to recover from, from this. And um, this is not because of China. This is what the damage we're doing to ourselves. And I think this is really detrimental. Uh, Bilhari, you worked, you were the uh, representative in the United Nations. You've had a lot to do with the Middle East in recent years. Are there any genuine uh, issues of proliferation, nuclear proliferation that are concerning about this latest deal? I will answer that, but before that, can I say a word about the uh, other issue you raised with uh, Sun and uh, Nadine, right? Look, I think when the history of this period is going to be written, uh, an objective historian will conclude that Mr. Xi Jinping squandered a great advantage that China had, maybe 10 years ago <laughs> or so. Uh, China's rise was not perceived as threatening until relatively recently, 10 years, 15 years. And the Chinese themselves were very careful to ensure it was so. But sometime towards the end of the Hu Jintao era, and certainly under Mr. Xi Jinping, the old approach of hiding your light and biding your time of reassuring countries that the rise or the development of China, because even rise was considered too provocative a word, would be peaceful. That seemed to have gone out of the window. And recently, Mr. Xi Jinping, a few months ago anyway, told a group of, uh, I think, Communist Party cadres that they should look of, to make China more lovable, <laughs> look to make China more respectable, more credible, and expand China's circle of friends. It seems to me that they, that is a remarkable uh, implicit recognition that Chinese foreign policy has failed. Because the purpose of foreign policy is not, is to complement your strategic interests by making sure your strategic interests are accepted as widely as possible, but China has not succeeded in that. Uh, that said, look, let's again not be hypocritical. The NPT regime is effectively dead and only awaits a decent funeral. None of us is prepared to say so, governments I mean, but the fact is that uh, it died quite some time ago and it was a lingering death, <laughs> but we need to understand that reality. I don't think we should discard the PT because there are other, there are other uh, positives in it that should be preserved, but nuclear proliferation is a reality, all right? It died, the last nail in that coffin was actually when between the US and India's civilian nuclear deal in uh, 2008, despite the US, uh, India's acquisition of nuclear weapons. The Middle East, is seething with countries that want to emulate Israel's um, undeclared nuclear capability. Uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, even Egypt, Turkey. Uh, I think the trajectory is set. The trajectory has been set in East Asia, Japan, South Korea have that idea. I mean, I don't think it's going to be easy for any of them, not going to be easy for Australia. But unless there is a fundamental change in Chinese behavior, which is the main driver of this, 
which I think is unlikely, that we are on that trajectory. The Middle East, and it's not necessarily a very dangerous trajectory, it's going to be a very fraught trajectory, but in the end, if I am right, and I hope I'm not right, but if I am right, and there will be more nuclear, independent nuclear deterrence under the overall uh, nuclear umbrella of the US, uh, it will be a fairly stable situation. The same thing happened in Europe many, uh, many decades ago, almost 70 odd years ago, once the Soviet Union got nuclear weapons. China is improving its nuclear second strike capability, and there is nothing sinister about this. In fact, it is the correct thing to do for any nuclear power. It would be irresponsible not to try to improve your second strike capability. But once you have done that, the question will arise as it did in Europe before, will New York or San Francisco be sacrificed to save Tokyo or Seoul? The answer yes. is obviously no. no. And many things follow from that. So the Middle East is a bit different because you know East Asia, these are coherent states, these are rational states, even North Korea, whose only goal is regime survival, and that's a relatively limited goal. Uh, Middle East, you have a whole host of rather unstable countries, intrinsically unstable, internally unstable countries uh, with nuclear ambitions. That is another matter. But I'm afraid it's too late. The genie is out of the bottle long ago. We just don't want to admit it, that's all. Okay. Um, Yun, if I could go back to a, a point that uh, Bill Ahari made before, claiming that China had squandered a potential, you know, a strategic opportunity or a strategic leverage. Um, just, I mean, you spoke a little bit about this before, but, I mean, it's described, there's a lot's been happening in China recently, mainly on domestic policy. Um, uh, but also foreign policy as well to do with the United States, everything from military issues to management of data and the like. But to go to Bilahari's point, um, you know, how would a Chinese official uh, explain that in private in terms of the domestic politics of China, uh, um, but perhaps to counter that claim? Those are very interesting questions, um, Richard. First off, I, I agree with Bill Harry. I think the, the Chinese certainly has squandered a lot of um, goodwill that it was able to accumulate throughout the, uh, the, I would say the 30 years between 1979 and somewhere around 2008. So, um, but how was that decision made and whether that was a predestined direction that China would go into. So yes, people do talk about um, China was hiding its strengths and biding its time. But don't forget, hiding your strengths and biding your time is not an end. It's a means to an end. It was a process. But the end game through that process eventually is some sort of China regaining its status in the, in the world. Deng Xiaoping did not say that. Deng Xiaoping only said that, hey, we, well, we should hide our strengths. But hide our strengths to do what? Hide our strengths by yourself is not, uh, is not a goal per se. So I think that partially or in a major part provided the justification or the legitimacy for Xi Jinping changing China's foreign policy posture. Because uh, before Xi Jinping took over, Chinese people, some of the nationalists were sending calcium pills to foreign ministry for the Chinese diplomats to grow some backbones. You probably remember that. Yeah. There were also this view that China was rich, but China was weak. So therefore, the, the narrative goes that even small countries like Vietnam and the Philippines could even bully China in the South China Sea. So I think Xi Jinping's assertive turn, his uh, foreign policy, certainly has a, has a historical and has a, um, I would say, a popular justification to it. So he successfully catered to a certain, uh, certain opinion in, in China. But coming to Chinese domestic policy today, we always hear this version uh, or this view that, well, China has to be assertive in its foreign policy in order for the Chinese leader to gain, is, uh, to protect his, uh, his domestic agenda so that he can extract popularity and legitimacy to push forward his domestic agenda. Well, that might be the case, but today I think the, the things have certainly got a little out of hand, but probably not from Beijing's perspective. In Beijing's view, everything in China should be under the party's control. And there should not be 
groups of people or groups of business that would be so strong and so powerful that would put the government in defense. So a lot of the recent um, domestic changes that we have seen, including the structural and regulatory changes that we're seeing, I think is a very clear sign that the state is reclaiming its dominance of the national economy and of the Chinese society in a holistic manner. I think that's pretty clear. Now, now, Nadej, before we go to audience questions, just let me ask you about Europe. France, you know, it's it's a collection of different countries, but also, an, you know, an, a, with an attempt to build a, a foreign policy. Uh, there's no European military and the like, but there's greater interest in the Indo-Pacific and certainly urging from many countries for the Europe to be more greatly involved. There's also talk about how this decision sets that back. You know, the so-called pro-American factions, whatever, in the French foreign ministry have been damaged by this and, they, and uh, people who want to engage with China uh, more intensely will be uh, empowered in Germany as well. What's your sense on, on Europe? Is, you, you know, China-Europe relations have been difficult but not fractured. Um, wh where are we going uh, for Europe's China policy in a security sense from here? The announcement of AUKUS coincides with the publication of Europe's Indo-Pacific strategy, which is very ironic uh, and has been completely sidelined by the other news. Um, I think, yes, it's fractured, but also in Europe, I think the perception of China has dramatically changed over a very short period of time, perhaps three, four years. Uh, and um, there's a there's more doubts also about the, the, the way to conduct our diplomacy with, uh, with China nowadays. Um, it used to be seen as a, an economic opportunity more than anything else. Now it's more, it's seen as a, and I'm using the words of the EU, a systemic challenge. Um, so, and I think these uh, appreciations of, of where China, or of China's trajectory are not going to change anytime soon. Um, the, the decisions that are being made at, at the level of Brussels um, are also here to stay. You know, they have been longly matured, uh, and uh, and they they are going to continue to. I'm not sure it's, it's this is in, in other words, sorry for uh, being not so clear, but um, I'm not sure this is going to change, radically change anything in any direction. In other words, it's not going to be suddenly that all the Europeans are going to turn their back on America. And it's not going to be the case that they're going to radically go embrace uh, Beijing. Um, they're going to find their own strategic autonomy. That's the buzzword today in Europe, meaning uh, something that it's not aligned uh, neither to Beijing or to Washington, knowing perfectly well um, that to, to take uh, Bilahiri's word, let's not be hypocritical, knowing perfectly well that both our values and our interests are actually coincide better with Washington's vision than with Beijing's. So that's the current discussion in, in, in Brussels. Okay, so I want to go to some questions which were sent to us. The first I'll go to is a John, John Moore from the ANU. Um, just the second part of his question, Bill, I'll, I'll ask Bill Hari this first and others can chime in. The, the headlines have all been about submarines. The first actual submarines won't arrive unless we borrow some or have some based here until 2040. But there's also talk about uh, uh, more US military being based or uh, uh, in, in Australia um, and about missiles, uh, missile technology transfer and the like. I wonder if those issues are more proximate and more important than submarines in, in the short term and might have a bigger impact. Well, yeah, I think it, um, it will have a bigger impact because it's going to be more immediate as you said, I think it takes at least a decade or so if you're going to build these submarines yourself, right? Uh, before they are actually floating around or, or uh, anywhere. Uh, but I think it's all in the same ballpark. I think we should not lose sight of what is driving this. Uh, I think 
much of it is Chinese domestic politics, the need to justify uh, a certain approach domestically, uh, validate a certain approach domestically by showing it externally. Now that uh, it's done, it's not going to be easy to be reversed. I think it. I think uh, uh, Sun is right. Sooner or later, Sun is right that you know uh, this idea of hiding your capabilities, hiding your light, is a tactic to an end. Right, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, no less than any other China leader, wants to see China reclaim its place in the world. But as we had talked about America in Afghanistan and this written decision, how you do it is very important too. You know, uh, both the Afghanistan decision and the uh, AUKUS decision are, I think, correct decisions, but the manner in which they were carried out could have been much better. Similarly, I think nobody, uh, nobody would deny that China's rise and its recrimination of its place in, in the region of the world is going to be a fact, whether anybody likes it or not. But how you carry it out is important. So, you know, I don't think, you know, these are all details to me, you know, how many troops are going to be stationed in Northern Australia? Are you going to put missiles? What kind of missiles? These are technical operational details of a certain trajectory, a certain framework that is already being set and set rather quickly. And it was not inevitable, by the way, it's not inevitable. So dated it from 2008, I'll be a, I would say maybe a bit later, but that's, that's another detail, right? Maybe 2010. But since yeah. then, a, a certain trajectory has been set. And it's driven by two factors. China is one factor. But the other factor, don't forget, is a more transactional America. <laughs> and in this sense, Mr. Biden may be more polite than Mr. Trump, but I don't think his fundamental attitudes are any different. As I have told some of my former colleagues in the ASEAN countries, you want to be consulted, but you're not going to be consulted because of your good looks and natural charm. You're going to be consulted to see what you, what you are prepared to do with the US. You know? That is the purpose of consultation. It's not just, you know, you're such a charming person, people love your company, and they will come and to your meetings and talk to you for the sake of talking to you. Uh, I think we should not forget that. Yeah. Yun, um, let me ask the same question of you. I mean, at the start, you said, for example, China can afford to study this uh, agreement a little first because that nothing changes overnight. But if it does also involve the transfer of uh, other uh, military uh, technologies, if uh, they start, start talking about missiles um, uh, based in Australia and missile technology, uh, cyber technologies, will, will China respond much more quickly? Submarines are way off in the never never. Yeah, I think the, the question is uh, what those response will look like and whether they will be limited to military domain and to the security domain. Because uh, I have seen plenty of analysis in the Chinese narrative that in terms of bilateral economic and trade relations, China hasn't really do the critical damage that it could inflict on Australia. So I think moving forward to uh, as a part of the Chinese reaction to this uh, to this Australia strategic move, I think there are plenty of voices in China calling for a harsher trade and economic policy towards Australia. So that's one aspect of the Chinese reaction that has already been discussed. And the other one is uh, what people, I mean, strategic thinkers are all thinking about, which is a regional arms race that if Australia is boosting its uh, cybersecurity uh, capability and boosting its missile capability, and even if this nuclear powered submarine would not be delivered in the immediate future, but inevitably Australia's security capability will be in enhanced as a result of this trilateral security cooperation pact, then China inevitably will have to enhance its own military development in order to match what Australia has achieved because Australia might see, well, from the US, UK, and Australia's perspective, China is a single target. But if, if you are sitting in Beijing, you are looking at multiple countries trying to build up their, their security forces, and China will have to respond to all of them simultaneously. So that's a real danger, I think, for China in terms of the regional arms race. It's not China versus another country. It's China versus 
probably the rest of the region. I think that's a real danger here. That's certainly the case. That brings me to another question from Mark Ahrens, which I'll direct to you, Nadesh. On this regional arms race, um, Japan or South Korea, could they now decide to pursue a nuclear submarine program? And of course, they may be able to do it by themselves. Well, that's, that's what we're discussing about earlier, the possibility of opening that Pandora box and, and that uh, other countries in, in the region are going to, to push for something that they've been uh, more or less been coveting for quite a while. Uh, but for a set of reasons, didn't really, couldn't, wouldn't do it. Uh, so hard to say. This, this is certainly something that both countries have, have thought about for, for quite some time. Yes, Bilhari, it's very interesting if you look, for example, at the debate in Germany amongst the candidates to succeed Angela Merkel. There's very little foreign policy discussion. If you look at the race for the new head of the LDP uh, to succeed Mr. Suga, there's been a lot of very public discussion about China, Taiwan, you know, very security focused. I mean, do you see, uh, I mean, Japan has been evolving for some time. Do you see any major changes perhaps triggered by this agreement in Japan? I think, I think as I mentioned before, uh, it's triggered approximately by, by North Korea and secondly by China's modernization of nuclear forces to improve its second strike capability, especially its SLBMs. Uh, and, and that has, for some years now, triggered quiet debates in Japan about what should be the response. But you know, I think, all of you know, I think, that the uh, US-Japan nuclear cooperation agreement is unique in that since 1988, it has allowed for automatic authorization for Japan to reprocess American supplied nuclear material. Right? And it's unique in that sense. And that is, and there's only, well, there are several reasons, but you know, if you need to, if you have any ambitions of becoming a nuclear weapon state, the most difficult thing is to get the fissionable material. Uh, I don't think that's an obstacle for Japan. They've got quite a lot of plutonium stashed away. They always talk about it being stashed away in France and UK, but they forget to mention or say very quietly that quite a lot of it is stashed away in Japan too. Uh, so I think they can be if they want. And a few years ago, 2016, I believe, there was an open public debate in the Korean National Assembly, South Korean National Assembly about, among other things, whether uh, South Korea should acquire a domestic nuclear weapon capability. Um, as I said, this, these thoughts that arise are inherent in the logic of the situation. That is why these things arose in Europe maybe 70 years or so ago, and they are now coming to the fore in our own region. I don't think you can stop this, except if there is a fundamental change in the strategic environment, which I don't see. Question from Michael Wellman. Um, it says, what effect might this pact have on the probability of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Now, I'm not suggesting, by the way, we're looking at that in the short term, and I doubt this pact one way or another has any immediate effect on that issue. But Yun, give us your view on where Chinese thinking is, is at at the moment on Taiwan, because it's a question that we're asked all the time, because people seem to think China's about to uh, invade, quote unquote. Um, but of course, the regaining Taiwan or gaining Taiwan is absolutely baked into the cake in Chinese domestic politics. W where is Beijing at the moment on the Taiwan issue? Sure, Richard, that's a, that's a great question. So is this, uh, is this going to have an impact over China's policy or China's posture towards Taiwan? Actually, interestingly, in the Chinese policy community, there is this voice saying that well since Australia's nuclear power submarine will be will be will be delivered somewhere down the future then between now and that future is a strategic window of opportunity that China should seize that China should capture Taiwan before these submarines are delivered I don't think this is a mainstream view but I would like to point out that this view certainly exists if uh, we look at the China's official statement about Taiwan and China's unification policy 
currently peaceful unification is still advocated as the official policy. So China does not give up the use of force, but it doesn't mean they prefer the use of force at this current stage. The thing for the Chinese, the, the question always lies in to what extent the US will intervene, US and its allies are going to intervene in the Taiwan contingency. And as a result of that intervention, is China still going to prevail? I think there's no clear answer on that, on that question. The Chinese would like to believe that because of the geographical advantage that China enjoys, the Taiwan Strait is only that close to, to mainland China, China is going to prevail in Taiwan contingency regardless. But I don't think that answer is so certain coming out of the PRA strategic assessment, because it eventually depends on how much resources US is willing to allocate and how much mobilization US is willing to conduct and how many allies will be siding with the United States in that, in that contingency. Just think about the naval blockade imposed on China through the South China Sea or in the Indian Ocean. There are consequences that will be severe even for, even for China. Thank you, Nadesh. Now, this is a rather backward looking question, but it gets, it's in a lot of the press coverage in the last week. It's from uh, Patrick Fair. Um, would the French have sold Australia nuclear powered subs? Would they have been willing to share that capability? It's people are saying, well, why didn't we simply have a bidding contract for nuclear powered subs? The French could have bid for that. Um, what, what, what's your response to that? Uh, I think I won't, I won't betray anything if I say that during the negotiations, I think at some points the French party has um, realized that this might be a possibility for um, the Australian party. And so they talked about it and uh, said, is, do you want to change the contract and, and have something nuclear instead of conventional? Um, and the response from Australia wasn't really clear, apparently. Uh, so um, this, is, this is also why this has come uh, with such a huge surprise for, for the French, because uh, Australia didn't seem to, uh, to envisage this because because of you know domestic politics, there's a I'm not going to tell you, Richard, the, the difficulties inside of Australia with the anti-nuclear uh, lobby and 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 um, so it's uh, it 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 really came as a surprise. It's not something I don't think that the French government would have immediately said no. I think it would have taken some time to ponder. A little bit further, uh, especially with the implications for non-proliferation in particular, um, but it was uh, it was never on the table. Okay, thanks. This is the final question to uh, Bilahari. Uh, on my Excel spreadsheet, the name has been cut off. I'm afraid they don't print out very well. But what um, I think there's been a general view in Australia that we've uh, we've been very active diplomacy with Quad countries, with the UK, with the US with the Pacific countries, but light on, relatively speaking, with Southeast Asia, which is a real gap for us or somewhere we've lagged on. Do you agree with that? And what advice would you give the Australian government? In that so respect? all, I don't agree. I don't agree. Uh, the two most um, important partners, apart from China and US uh, of ASEAN have always been Australia and Japan. Uh, what Australia does in Southeast Asia doesn't grab the headlines, but you have been doing it and doing it consistently for a very long time, and it's very welcome. So I don't agree with the statement in the first place. Okay, well, on that positive, negative, positive note, um, <laughs> we'll conclude this uh, 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 cast. Thank you very much, all three of you, Nadez Roland, Bilahari Kausakan, and Yunsun. Really great to have you on. Um, thanks to Josh Gooding and Andrea Pollard at Lowy for helping pull this together uh, on short notice. Uh, thank you very much.